welcome to this event. Um, I'm really excited to see so many people coming in um, and participating here today for this SciArt concert and lecture. This is an event that is co-hosted by the Earth Institute, which is part of Columbia University, as well as Climate Week New York City. And um, earlier this week, I was scrolling through Instagram and I saw this like cheesy, you know, Motivation Monday quote, which said, uh, when is the last time you did some, something for the first time? And I actually stopped and I thought, this is it here. Today, I'm gonna do something for the first time in my life, at least, which is a very different and new way of how I present the research and work that I do on sea level change, which is through the medium of music and, and visual arts. And um, I'm really excited to have you all with me on this journey. And um, we'll go through this together today. You will see at the bottom of um, bottom or side of your Zoom window that there is a Q&A option. If you have any questions, please um, start dropping them in there during the presentations. Uh, we will get to that at the last 10 to 15 minutes of this presentation. And those can be questions that are about the science that we'll present, or they can be questions about the music, uh, the composition, the collaboration. Um, and we're really excited to hear from you what you think. With that, I'm gonna start by briefly giving you a sense of one of the team that has been working on this presentation and putting this together. So this is myself, I'm Jackie Osterman. I'm an assistant professor in geophysics at Columbia uh, University. Um, we also have Lea Luca Sikau. She's a mezzo-soprano and is doing, currently doing her PhD at Cambridge University in ethnomusicology. And then we have Eve O'Donnell and she's a composer and artistic producer at National Sawdust in New York City. And you'll hear from Lea Luca and Eve in just a little bit. So this is part of New York City Climate Week. And so I assume a lot of you might be living in New York City at some time, maybe not right now, or have some, some connection to New York City, maybe. As you know, this is a buzzing and crazy city. It's also a city that's on the ocean and it's a city that's surrounded by water. And it's as such, it's a city that is dealing, or is trying to deal with um, and figure out ways to deal with the rising sea level and sea level change. Um, many of you who've been in New York for a while might remember that this is not a, um, a challenge that is new to New York. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy created a storm surge that was more than 11 feet high, so three and a half meters of sea level rise as the hurricane came, came through and pushed the high waters and the high tides towards the city and affected the electricity and it flooded the subway, flooded various properties into the Hudson, all the way up into the Hudson Valley and had of course a huge impact on life in New York City and people living in New York City. Of course, these challenges associated with sea level rise with both sort of the slow and constantly rising sea level as well as these short-term events um, uh, associated with storms and storm surges don't just affect New York City, obviously. In fact, 40% of world's population lives along the coastlines. So thinking about sea level change and, and the challenges um, associated with, with it is something that affects us globally. If we think about um, New York City, I wanna share with you a little bit about what the projections are of how sea level might change, because if we wanna deal with that challenge, we of course need to know what, what the exact challenge is, right? How much will sea level actually rise in the, next in, in the next decades or in the next centuries? And I'm showing this here on a plot where we have um, on the, on the x-axis time going from 1900 up to 2100. And on the y-axis, we have sea level change and we have feet on the left and meters on the right. So you can choose whichever metric you prefer. Um, and this is the observed sea level change that has been me measured by a tight gauge in Battery Park. And projections for New York City are that sea level is going to be rising. So it'll uh, rise up to very likely a meter. You'll see sort of here an, a sense of uncertainty of that range um, by, the, uh, by the end of the century. Um, and you'll see that the, the uncertainty bounds on here are quite large. And this, that is a result of two things. One, it's a result of 
We don't know how high temperatures are going to be. We don't know how high emissions, how emissions are going to evolve over this time period. And that's something where all of us can actually have an input on driving this up if we emit more and temperatures keep rising or keep this low if we emit less CO2 and keep temperatures at a lower level. But there's an, another effect, of course, in here that propagates uncertainty, and that is we you know, need to understand the Earth's system. And even if we knew exactly how warm temperatures were by the end of the century, we don't, we, you know, there, there's uncertainty in how that affects ice sheets and how it affects sea level. And in fact, um, the biggest contributor over the next century um, will be both warming in the oceans and thermal expansions associated with it. But it will also be the melting of ice sheets and the ice sheets have already just the last decade or so started um, to melt. This is the Antarctic ice sheet and you see particularly this part which is Western Antarctica um, is starting to melt quite severely. There's a, there's a very active region of uh, research to understand how susceptible it is to um, the temperature warming. And, um, and yeah, rising temperatures in both air and in the oceans. So with this kind of like very brief overview of why sea level change matters for most people um, because so many just live along, along the coastlines and particularly why it matters for New York City, I wanna start with three questions here, which is how can we better understand sea level change, and I will be telling you more about this in the way that I try to answer that question in my research. But then, of course, here we're also focusing on the angle of how can we communicate the science behind it. Is the best way of communicating this through lectures? How can we bring in the biggest audience and communicate it in a way that it actually sticks? Um, and we're exploring that a little bit here today. And of course, the reason we want to communicate this efficiently is that we want to inspire change and we want to inspire change that is long lasting and that lasts, you know, beyond a four to eight year political term. And, um, and that comes from not just what politicians or scientists tell you, but that actually comes from change within the community because communities will have to adjust over the next centuries one way or the other um, to this challenge. And lastly, before I hand the mic over to the musical team. I want to say that I want to leave this kind of intro with that, you know, I think we need to figure out how we can communicate this urgency and this challenge while not being alarmist. When I talk to people about my, that I study sea level change, they often say, well, that sounds like, you know, a drag. <laughs> but actually it's, a, it's a studying the earth, studying coastlines is a beautiful thing. And I hope I'll show you that through my work later on and you'll hopefully get a sense of this beauty also through the music and the visual arts. Um, and this all is kind of wrapped into how do we communicate um, the science behind all of this. And with that, I'm gonna hand the mic over um, to Eve and Leah Luca who will tell you a little bit about um, the, the musical aspects of how we can think about communicating science. And I will stop my screen share. There we go. And I'll hand it over to Lea Luca. Thank you so much, Jackie. Yeah, there was there were so so many inspiring questions, and uh, these were also the the reasons why we came together. So I'm Lea Luca. I'm the curator and also mezzo soprano of the project. And besides that, I'm doing my PhD at Cambridge University. Um, my research interests lie in how. Um, we can explore epistem the epistemology of inventive art science collaborations. So how can we come together and use the arts not only as a dissemination tool and the sciences not only as another tool, but how we can really profoundly interact and find pat patterns how this um, gets done successfully. Um, I did a research project recently at Harvard and MIT to really see how and which patterns um, can can lead to those successful collaboration. And um, so I firmly believe that with the multifaceted challenges we face, we really have to address them. And um, by addressing them, we also have to go beyond our also artificially historically constructed disciplines and um, yeah, create interesting and interdisciplinary collaborations. 
And so um, I initiate this science art collaboration with Eve and Jackie and the Earth Institute. And before we are showcasing our music video, I just wanted to point out three aspects which might be crucial in order to better understand the project. So first of all, there are different text bits, different patterns of text in the video. Um, there are equations, there are geologic timescales, but also um, there is instructional text in the beginning and in the end. And um, the method of instructional text I've, I learned while I was working with Marina Abramovich over the last several months. And um, this method um, helps to break down, for example, in, in this case, scientific processes and to reflect on them. And also we have the instructional text in the beginning and in the end. So in the middle, there's the composition and the composition um, thus embodies some sort of um, alternative way for the di dissemination of scientific results. The second aspect I wanted to point out is the symbolism we will use. Um, I don't want to take away too much, but um, for example, the ring, which you also see in my virtual background here, um, stands for traces of humanity. And also we use the word Anthropocene. So when it is sung the second time, um, you might have a closer listen and see what's going on in the video. Um, and thirdly, another way how we included Jackie's research is not um, just about the inspiration, but it's, all, it's a lot about patterns and also creating analogies. For example, between geologic timescales on the one hand and um, bars in the music and also um, strokes on the coastlines. So without much further ado, I want to hand over to our composer Eve, um, and she's going to tell you more about the musical side of the piece. Thank you, Leah Luca. So for those of you um, who don't know me, um, my name is Eve O'Donnell, and I'm the composer on the project. Um, I'm also a vocalist and a curator, and I work as the artistic producer of the Composer Mentorship Initiatives at National Sawdust, which is a music venue in Brooklyn. So each of these roles in my life help to build momentum in my artistry. Um, and I see the importance of valuing ourselves as multifaceted individuals as it's key to building a sustainable career. Um, my instrument is the voice and the piano and working as a composer specifically for uh, the voice and choir is the inspiration for my craft. Um, as a composer, I like to explore where the issues of climate change and music meet and how this has the potential to impact the public consciousness for change. So through this SciArt collaboration, we've taken the data from Jackie's work and implemented it into the music. So looking at the work from a compositional lens, um, there's a deep duality within the music. The counterpoint between the voice and the guitar is composed in a way that it allows them to respond to each other's movements. Um, and similar to that of the shape of the ocean's surface and the seabed that it lies upon. So harmonically, to create this, um, I wanted to use the use of uh, parallel sixths, which represent the, equi uh, the gravitational equipotential surfaces that circle the Earth. An addition to this as well was that I interspersed ninths throughout the music um, with the intention of representing the nominal average strength of Earth's gravity, which is 9.80665, I believe. <laughs> um, so while exploring Jackie's research on a more in-depth level, um, which, you know, it spans across ice age sea level, long-term sea level, plate tectonics and geodyn geodynamics, there's so much there. Um, I was moved by her work on local sea level change and the idea that um, of glacial rebound. So what that means, if I'll try and explain, um, is that after a land glacier melts, the land it was once impressed upon is still moving and rebounding slowly and long after the melt water is gone. So I wanted to capture this movement in the music as it resonates with me. Um, and with that, also kind of what it means to be human, um, because we're impacted by the nature that we encounter, you know, both while it's with us, 
but also when it's gone. And we feel a lasting impact of the, the decisions we make that affect the relationship with our environment. So on that note, um, I will now share my screen with you um, and I'll introduce the musicians. And as you already heard, our mezzo-soprano is our very own Leah Luca Sikau. And the classical guitarist is Damien Kelly. Um, so this is our pilot project, um, which let me just share the screen with you now. This is our pilot project, which is uh, essentially it's like initiates the start of an innovative dissemination events and encounters. And we hope to have um, a web res. We, we're working towards web residency with the German consulate later this year. So we hope that you enjoy it. Travel to destination, walk along the coastline, spot the outcrop, interpret your observation, measure the elevation, collect the sample, return home, analyze the sample, calculate sea level change. Uniform perturbation of the gravitational equipotential surface is identical to minus 1 over A times rho I divided by rho W times the integral of delta I over the surface of the Earth plus the integral of SL times the ocean function over the surface of the Earth.
Paris in the presence of evolving topography, where sea meets land is a constantly shifting boundary. When I think about sea meeting land, the I think of contrast, temperature, shape, dynamics, where sea meets land is a constantly shifting boundary. Present the findings, disseminate the work. So now I would like to reintroduce Jackie, who is going to give her presentation on the analogies within the work. So please welcome you back, Jackie. Thank you, Eve. I'm going to go and share my screen again. Okay. Um, so what I want to do now is kind of break that music video down a little bit and use it um, to tell you a little bit about my work on sea level change and some of the um, concepts that you've hopefully seen in the music video, translate them into the scientific uh, realm. And I'm going to be focusing on four aspects that were highlighted in the music video. I'm going to start by talking about geologic time and how um, we need to understand kind of Earth's behavior over long time scales in order to understand what's going to happen, how sea level is going to change in the future. Then I'm going to take you with me into the field and we'll actually walk through the steps of um, the scientific approach that Lea Luca had in her, in the instructional part of the video. I'll also talk a little bit about the sea level equation and the little bits of equation that you've heard in the music and try to put that in context of where that comes in in our sea level work. Um, and then I'm going to wrap up by bringing that back to what that means, what we find about sea level, um, the evolution of sea level, and what that means bringing it back to changing coastlines and um, New York City. Okay, so starting with geologic time, and you saw this represented in the video by this time scale here that then was kind of flooded with water. Um, in this in this little video, what you see is that climate, this is a reconstruction of how ice sheets and sea level has changed over the last half a million years. And you see that even you know, before humans were widely around the globe, see climate has been changing and ice sheets have been waxing and waning, um, affecting sea level of around all of the coastlines. And you see, um, big areas of land that were connected once upon a time. And you see this rebound that Eve actually talked about, and I'll get back to um, a little bit later. As the ice sheet melts, um, the land is sort of rebo rebounding, climbing back its territory and sea level is falling locally. So this is the, this is the current you know, time which we find ourselves in in Earth's history. Half a million years is actually not very long for a geologist. For most other peoples, it seems that seems like a really long time period. Um, but we're currently at this state, at a time when ice sheets um, are smaller than they were for over the last 20,000 years. And if we go back into the whole evolution of, um, of Earth, we find ourselves in these ice ages that happened during the Pliocene and the Pleistocene, so the last few million years. Of course, Earth's history is a lot longer. And if we study Earth's deeper history, we find that climate varies naturally. And actually, most of Earth's history was warmer than today. Now, when you present this work, I often, or a lot of people often come back to me and say, well, so, you know, climate change, you know, isn't man-made or isn't real. And that's far from the opposite. Um, so the Earth, the climate on Earth's surface varies naturally. And it was warmer in the past. All we can learn from that is height that times when temperatures were high, CO2 was high. And what we can also learn from that is that um, the increase that we see in temperatures today and in CO2 today is pretty much unprecedented in Earth's history. And it's not surprising, we know where it comes from, right? We're pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. We understand the greenhouse effect, it affects temperatures and that causes sea level rise and it's caused um, by us. However, because the Earth's temperatures were warmer in the past, we can actually use the Earth's history as a natural laboratory to study 
how high sea level was when temperatures are warmer. And we do this by looking at when temperatures were warmer in the past, and then take that knowledge to tell us about how temperature, how sea level is gonna rise as temperatures warm in the future. So answering the question of how high will sea level rise under future, future warming, we can turn this around by saying how high was sea level when temperatures were one degrees, two degrees, three degrees warmer in the past. And the time periods that I focus on predominantly is the last interglacial 120,000 years ago, the mid Pliocene or even the early Pliocene. And that, those are times when temperatures were a few degrees warmer than today. So I think this is an, an important context. And with that, I'm going to take you into the field. So we're interested in understanding how high sea level was um, 125,000 years ago. So how do we do that? And I'm going to show you. Yeah, there we go. So let's go into the field. The first thing, and that's how the music video starts, right, is travel to destination. And I'm going to travel to destination with you, and we're going to go to the Bahamas. So you have here for reference, this is Florida, this is Cuba, and the Bahamas is this giant carbonate platform. Everything that shows up in kind of the turquoise is a it's relatively shallow seas. Um, and then you see this islands and these whole island chains kind of poking up uh, above the sea level. And I'll be taking you to Crooked Island, which is this island down here. Why do we go to the Bahamas to understand past how high sea level was in the past. Oh, first of all, the Bahamas are beautiful, <laughs> as many of you will know. Why do we go here? And it turns out that the Bahamas are a great place to study sea level because um, it's a place where we have a lot of sediment that forms and that cements in place. And essentially, um, it's an environment that takes snapshots, it takes photos of what environmental conditions were like at specific times in the past. So sand turns into rock really quickly. You see, um, you might see kind of these sort of wavy features here in the rock. And these are caused because these were actual dune systems. Um, if you go to Fire Island or any other place on, on earth where you are at a beach, you'll see these dunes and in the Bahamas, they actually get cemented and turn into rock so quickly that once we went to an outcrop and we saw this rock unit and we're like, ah, oh, Maybe it's a, a thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years old, and very quickly, looking at it closer, we saw that there was actually a coke bottle cemented into it. So um, the cementation here is really quickly, and so it provides great snapshots um, of environmental conditions. And the environmental conditions that we look for are any indicators that tell us something about sea level. So this could be living. Uh, this could be corals because corals live at a specific depth below the sea surface. Um, here on the left, you see a living coral, and here you see a fossilized coral that's 125,000 years old. So it was actually alive at the last night glacial. And that's a clue for us, a little puzzle piece, how high sea level was at this specific location in the past. Um, another beautiful example from Crooked Island is these kind of beach ripples that you see here. And if you look closely in the rock, you see the, those same features. And again, it's pretty astonishing, but they cement into place. And they tell us this is this is the elevation at which sea level um, was when these uh, when these beach ripples formed. So that's why the Bahamas is a great spot. So we travel to destination. Next, we walk along the coastline, and um, so when we do this field work in the Bahamas. This is from last year. Literally, the whole day is spent walking on the, along the coastlines and looking for these little clues, these snapshots. Um, in the geologic records that are pictures of the, the ancient coastline. And as you can imagine, we try to, you know, this is us actually, <laughs> I should have pointed that out. Um, and we look, we spot, we try to spot the outcrop and the outcrop here, you see again, these sort of features, you might see this in the picture. This is again, a fossilized, fossilized coral reef. Um, and you can't see this in Google Earth. You can't even see this if you fly a drone over it. You have to walk over it. Um, to actually find it. So we spot the outcrop and then we interpret our observation and sometimes we look at it from afar and sometimes we look at it from really close, close up as these guys do here. And um, interpreting the observation is sort of like, you know, there are all these pictures taken of the, 
coastline at different times in Earth's history, and they are cemented into, uh, into the geologic record. But they're all jumbled up, right? We have one piece of information from one time and another piece from another. It's a little part of the picture, and we're trying to find all the different picture pieces and stitch them back together to actually understand how high sea level was at the specific time that we are reconstructing. So that's the interpret the observation. And then we take a proper survey of it. This is here a essentially like a fancy GPS. It's a satellite antenna. Um, here is a drone. The satellite antenna can give us very good um, elevation measurements up to a few centimeters. The drone can take tons of pictures, which is great because we can go back into the lab and stitch them all together and essentially take the outcrop into the lab with us, which is great for going back to it afterwards, after we have sort of, thought, you know, after, after we've returned to the field, if we want to revisit any interpretation. It's also great for um, outreach, right? Normally at Le Monde Open House, we have uh, augmented reality goggles and people can actually put them on and step into the field with, with us. Then we collect sample. Here you see my graduate student, Roger Creel, um, collecting a part of, oops, a part of this coral. Um, and here you see different coral bits. If you wanna collect corals for scientific use in the Bahamas and most places around the world, you need a specific permit. So you can, obviously these, are, these areas are protected. And then we return home. And I chose this picture for returning home because even though it's a beautiful place to be, it can also be a challenging place to be. It, the Bahamas, it rains. Um, it can start, you know, a rainstorm can come within half an hour. And this is our high tech wrapping a trash bag around the GPS. And you need to prepare, be prepared for it. There are mosquitoes everywhere. So it's also challenging, but it is also wonderful work. And um, once we are back home, we take the, these coral samples, for example, and we analyze them. And analyzing really means we want to know what the actual age is of a specific formation. And we dissolve the coral and send them through a mass, back, um, mass spectrometer, which looks like that. And that can tell us the age or the time at which that coral was alive. So this gives us individual snapshots of local sea level. And then we want to put them all together to calculate sea level change. And that brings me to the third part of this mini presentation, talking about the sea level equation. Why do we need an equation to calculate sea level? So I've, you know, I've walked you through the steps of how we reconstruct past sea level, and I've given you the context that we're interested in past sea level because it was a time when temperatures were warmer. So if we have, you know, we've gone to the Bahamas and we've reconstructed that sea level was three to four meters higher than it is today there. The challenge is that sea level at any one point on earth is not equivalent to the global, or rising, raising sea level in one place is not, is not equivalent to sea level rise in any other place. Sea level rise can vary from location to location and we need to adjust for that and that's why we need to solve an equation that's termed the sea level equation. And actually, <laughs> Eve gave you a great introduction for why this is. So why is sea level not rising uniformly everywhere like a bathtub? Why is sea level rising more or less in different places? And this is a photo here from, from the Arctic where you see these beach, small kind of beach ridges. And these are hundreds, 100 year, 200 year, 300 year, 400 year, 500 years old. So you see in this location, sea level has been falling by tens of meters over the last 100 years. But it's actually not sea level globally falling. It's the land that's rising out of the ocean that causes this local sea level fall. So everything is relative. Um, the land uplift here causes local sea level fall. And you see this really nicely depicted throughout the music video because it comes back to not just the sea level changes, but the land and sea level changes. The land component is a really important one, particularly if you live in the US. And I'll tell you why in a second. Again, Eve went through this, so I can go quick, quicker now, which is great. So the idea is that ice sheets are heavy, they depress 
the material underneath it, um, which causes subsidence of the solid earth, and it causes uplift at the periphery of this former ice sheet. During an, um, the deglaciation as the ice sheet melts, and if you think back of that video, you might remember that currently we are in a time when the Laurentide, Laurentide ice sheet, of course, big ice sheet over Canada, does not exist anymore. We have uplift in the areas that were formerly glaciated, um, and we have subsidence at these areas periphery of the ice sheet, which are termed the peripheral bulge. So this is what the ice looked like at the last glacial maximum. And all of these areas we depressed during that time. But along, kind of away from this ice sheet are areas that, were on, uh, that are on the peripheral bulge. And being on the peripheral bulge, that means today, the air, these areas are subsiding, the land's going down. And we see this all along the US East Coast. Those, so this is relative sea level over the 20th century. Um, along the US East Coast, you see it varies from place to place. It's two millimeters per year here, it's four millimeters per year here. And this kind of cross section is equivalent to this cross section, where here is the peak, you know, Virginia is on, on the peripheral bulge, and, and um, the sea level rise that you measure today there, half of it is because ice sheets are melting and sea level and um, uh, the oceans are expanding, but the other half is the solid earth subsiding. So I want to take you through a couple of the, um, so you know, we need to account for this both when we measure and understand present day sea level, but we also need to account for that when we reconstruct sea level in the Bahamas. And we do that through equations and I want to give you a little bit, a couple of tidbits from this um, because they, those were reiterated in the music. So Lea Luca was telling you in the music that sea level is the difference between G, which is the gravitational equipotential, so the bounding surface of sea level at the top, minus R, which is the Earth's bedrock elevation, which is this here. Okay. And if we have sediments, if we have ice, they add to the topography. But generally, sea level is the difference between you know, the bounding surface at the top and the bottom, pretty obvious. But that also means that sea level can change because of either. It can change because the gravitational potential field changes or because the solid um, surface changes. And that ends up being just the opposite, that definition, just the opposite of topography. If we want to cal calculate how sea level is changing in response to an ice load and in, you know, in response to the ice mass and the change in ocean mass over time and change in sediment mass over time, we need to first quantify where, where do we actually have changing ocean. And that's done through what's called the ocean function. And you might again remember that that was um, mentioned in the music. The ocean function is a function that's one everywhere where sea level is above zero. So in this area, and it is zero here. And we have, when we calculate the ocean load, so how much the ocean weighs down on the surface of the earth, we multiply sea level by this ocean function. And lastly, this is the last equation here. We have our, our surface load is then composed of these different masses, the ice mass, the sediment mass um, and the ocean mass. And if we calculate it low, we need to multiply that which, with the respective densities. Again, something that you might remember, I think back from the music videos. So the respective density of water, ice and sediment. That gives us our surface load. And then we can um, use kind of the physical relationships and, and, and um, uh, yeah, physical relationships that tell us how the surface of the earth as well as how the gravity field responds to this specific load. And we can use that to make predictions of present day sea level change or sea level change in the past, say during the last interglacial. And this here is just a prediction of such present day sea level change without any current ice mass. So even if ice or sea global mean sea level rise caused by thermal expansion and ice melt was to stop today, sea level change would continue 
because of this ongoing adjustment to the last ice age and by how much this will continue is shown in this um, prediction here. And this brings me to kind of the final part, thinking, bringing this back, okay, what have we learned? So we've gone into the field, um, we've collected data, we've now corrected it for any ups and downs associated with the, with the solid earth. And for these different time periods, what we find was that sea level was um, this out here, sea level for the last interglacial, probably four to six meters higher than today. If we go further back in time, uh, the last temperatures during the last interglacial were one to two degrees higher than today. The mid Pliocene was two to three degrees, early Pliocene three to four degrees, global average. And here you see how much higher sea level was. So even small perturbations in temperature can possibly lead to quite significant changes in sea level. And I should say here that this, these are sort of equilibrium state of the climate system. So today, even though we're you know, reaching one degree, two degrees warmer than in the you know, than pre-industrial levels, we don't um, instantaneously reach five or 10 meters of sea level rise. But this does tell you if we stick to one degrees warming, it's quite likely that we, in a few hundreds years that the, the equilibrium state of the climate system will lead uh, us to this amount of sea level rise. And if we stick to two to three degrees warming over a long time, we will eventually reach levels that are on this order. Um, bringing this back to the introduction from the beginning, so I've showed you these future projections and ongoing work um, of the whole community it's so really trying to use this information that we've gathered from the paleo, so from the past, um, and inform these future projections to reduce um, the uncertainty bars on these estimates. And, you know, this brings us back to New York City, and I want to, you know, um, Lea Luca mentioned this at the beginning in her little intro that the last step of the, in the music video is disseminate their work. Um, and so this is sort of, you know, it's actually part of the research process and this is what we're doing here. Normally I talk to a scientific audience, but I'm really excited about sharing um, this work with you today. And I want to end on just this part, which is a part text from, um, from the lyrics, which is when I think about sea love, sea meeting land, and this is um, Lea Luca and and Eve asked me about this. They said, what, what do you associate with, the, with sea level and the coast? And I thought about it. And for me, it's so beautiful. And it's a place of contrast because the color is different. The temperatures are so different if you're on land or you're going into the ocean. The pattern, the shapes, and the dynamics are so different between the solid earth and the dynamic ocean. And I think that is, makes this a really beautiful place. It makes it amazing place to study, but it also means that it's a place that is constantly shifting and um, shifting in a way that we need to, you know, as, a, as humanity, um, uh, learn to deal with as in cities, within native communities, within all of the different communities that exist along the shoreline. And with that, I'm going to and my presentation. And um, I'm encouraging you again to drop any questions that you might have in the Q&A. And I should have said earlier that you can also upload and like questions um, and that will kind of raise them in the Q&A box and we can kind of get to them faster. And with that, first, I'm gonna thank you all for listening to this mini presentation and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Jackie. That was fantastic. I really loved your presentation and it's so helpful and inspiring to be able to take that closer look into what's actually happening um, with sea level and coastline change. So I think if we open it up to questions and the three of us are just going to join each other in the panel section um, and as I'm, I'm going to read out the first one that we have uh, four votes on um, and the question is and I think maybe this could be for the three of us. Um, are there any forums, hubs, newsletters, or communities you would recommend for people interested in staying update on work happening at the nexus of climate science and art? So it's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, I think that there are a lot of initiatives um, across 
the industry that are presenting this. Leah Luca mentioned too earlier on that she had interacted with one was through Harvard and MIT. MIT do quite a lot to promote SciArt collaborations. Um, but in this case, you know, we've been working with the Earth Institute. Um, and they have they have a, a quite a substantial amount of events happening, which is a great place to start. Um, and maybe Jackie, you might have some ideas from other locations that would have such resources. I mean, my my first thought would also be kind of the Earth Institute signing up to their you know newsletters. They have a lot of great events, not just around um, as the question you know indicates, not just around sea level change, but climate science in general. Um, and they, yeah, they put on a lot of really great events. So I think that's a really great platform to connect to, to kind of stay up to date on some of these topics. Great. Okay. Maybe I, I might also add um, some, some details. So um, of course there's a Sci Art Initiative and they also have a newsletter and um, a lot of events are uh, happening in Boston and in New York City. Um, so maybe that's a good opportunity. There's also MPEG. Um, in the uh, New York State, so it's in Troy, it's two, two hours uh, upstate, um, and they are hosting amazing artists and they're interacting really well with scientists. Um, and then there's MIT's CAST, so it's a Center for Art, Science and Technology. Um, you should also get a, um, um, a possibility to join the newsletter there. And maybe from those who watch it from Germany, or somewhere else. Also the ZKM in Karlsruhe is a really great place, is a center for media art um, and they do innovative collaborations. So, but, but these are more, these collaboration endeavors are more generally related to arts and science, but you might find something related to climate change there. Um, however, we are also planning on developing it, this project further and we really hope that people who are seeing that and also who want to collaborate with us, uh, contact us. Uh, through social media, for example, uh, because we would like to also host web artist residencies for those types of specific projects. Great, so, thank you so much. I was just gonna say, I'm happy to jump on the next question, if I may, yeah, sure. and I'm gonna take the, the science, the earth science question, which is by Vivian Gornitz, and which is, how would you date the thick sand dune cliff the sand ripples that I set was um, 125,000 years old. Um, and the reason I'm very happy to jump on this is because we're developing um, now a new, potentially new method to, I mean, a method that's been used, but not super widely to date exactly those features. And essentially what you're dating, so the corals are easy to date because they, well, I say easy. They're, it's <laughs> it's very hard to actually get good ages, but it's possible to date because they were alive and as they die, their organism changes and we can track that point at which that happens. For the sedimentary features, we can potentially date kind of at what time period that sand grain, that little carbonate grain was produced. Um, and the assumption then is that it's produced and essentially cemented very very quickly after it was produced and in for and um, and um, cemented to form the ripples or to form the cliff face um, and we're working now on testing that hypothesis both the methodology and how we how well we can date the the, the age of the sand grain and when that was was produced um, and then also how well that assumption holds that it actually kind of records adequately the age of that specific feature and we're quite excited about that. Until now, it's mostly through um, having a, you know, a coral reef close to some of these other features and connecting it just through sort of a, um, building a full picture of how the, the fossil coral relates to the stratigraphic features right next to it. And so, so more through correlation so far, but we're hoping to actually um, uh, date it directly. Thanks for that question. I can jump in and read out the next question, which might be interesting for Eve. Uh, so there's one attendee uh, which thanks you, or yeah, thanks us for this extraordinary piece of interplay between music and science. Uh, you choose an encouraging harmony. I personally associate this topic with disharmony. Could you share your thoughts on the musical harmony in your piece? Yeah. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, I think, thank you for the question, by the way. Um, I appreciate your words. I think that 
it's interesting based on where the commission came from originally. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to create a live performance um, for guitar and voice. And through that, what we would have done is a very concert setting um, art song. So originally the kind of, the brief that was given to me from the parameters of the work were to create something that would work in, um, in that live concert setting specific to a kind of a tonal harmony um, requirement, let's say. But I think that as a lot of my other work that would deal with these um, issues, I would use a lot, a lot of dissonance. Um, and then the, the translation of that, putting that onto the guitar is actually quite interesting in itself because the guitar tends to work in very specific modalities. So when you are trying to incorporate certain amounts of dissonance, you kind of need to do it through in a structured way. So that's why um, I wanted to focus on different types of like harmony that filtered throughout the whole work um, and bring in conceptual ideas in this instance rather than just allowing um, the guitar to have more of a free, um, um, you know, like a free dissonant harmony that included more uh, semitones and um, alternative styles of techniques. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. And then if we would like to move on to the next one, which I think is a great open one for us, um, is from Elizabeth. How did your collaboration work in practice? Um, and I think that might be a nice one for maybe Leah Luca, you could open that up for us just from um, where the idea, the, the seeds for the actual collaboration came from. And then we can talk about um, it specifically as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, I also told you a bit about my research project um, in Boston. So I started off there and I just tried to see how arts and science can collaborate. And then German consulate approached me and asked me to, to curate a project for them on uh, music and science from kind of Leonardo da Vinci to today. Um, and so I was searching for inspiring personalities in New York who are also um, researching um, on environmental issues um, for, for which we can also commission a, a musical piece. Um, and as I knew Eve and her work on environmental change, um, and I, I tried to, to bring that all together. And so it, it was an int international collaboration. So we did not meet in person uh, with Jackie yet. I really hope that we will do in future. So we, we did a lot through Zoom and um, we gathered inspiration. We had looks into several papers of her and the equations used. And um, Jackie also um, spoke about how she, how we asked her to, to also give her thoughts on what happens when she meets land and what happens um, when you actually go there and can you break up the process into pieces and spits. So it worked like that. It was like a reiterative process. Yes, absolutely. And then what we then moved into just figuring out how that was going to functionally come together to create the work. So um, Leah Luca and I spent a lot of time uh, creating the storyboard, which um, I worked on from the musical side, but she worked on from the video uh, to develop the video along with a, vi a videographer. Um, so through that, we had just the recording process with the voice and guitar. And then I was working on creating the electronics um, through Ableton Live. Um, so as we started, things started to come together, we started to include the spoken text that was uh, it highlights Jackie's equation and so we were able to incorporate spoken but also the melody the vocal line which which introduces those elements too um, and then we moved into a process with like a lot of this was a new unique opportunity for us to dive into using um, technology in this way and we worked together to create the final product product to like through mixing and, mixing and mastering process. Um, and we now have a music video. <laughs> um, and then, so that kind of brings us to where we are at this moment. Um, and I think that, um, I think we probably are after reaching time. Um, so that's probably all we have time for today. I know there are still a lot of other questions. Um, we would love to be able to stay in contact with you. So maybe we can give you our email addresses afterwards if you'd like to reach out to us with your specific questions. 
Um, but for the moment, we just want to say thank you so much to everyone who joined. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, you know, uh, our good our good collaboration will inspire thinking, and we're hopeful that that's what we've done today, um, inspired some thought amongst everyone. And we're really grateful to the Earth Institute for hosting us. They've been they've been fantastic and helping us present our work as part of Climate Week NYC. Um, and we will, this event will be recorded and it will be hosted on the Earth Institute website where you can um, get our email addresses, you can um, stay in contact going forward and hopefully you'll be able to join us for the next part of the process which is our web residency um, through the German consulate in the fall. So from us, thank you so much. Um, and goodbye for now.